Uh, right, well, good afternoon everybody. I'd just like to start by thanking Howard for inviting me to speak here. And it's very appropriate this session is being held here in Cardiff, where Sir Cyril Fox was the director of the National Museum of Wales, where we all enjoyed our glass of wine last night. Well, I hope everybody did. And he did all the pioneering work on the Cambridgeshire dikes, um, on Offa's dike, and of course the Bonds dike. And it's also very appropriate that um, this year's theme is time, because the, one of the great problems with understanding the dikes is their dating. <coughs> yeah, let's see. Right. At best, we can put some of the dikes as post Roman, while other earthworks float somewhere between the prehistoric and the post Roman. And they have dual identities and dual interpretations of their function and purpose. Uh, one good example is the Roman rig in South Yorkshire. We have no firm dating evidence and so varies from being the southern boundary of the Iron Age Bagantes to a post-Roman border of the British Kingdom of Elmet or to a boundary defining the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Northumbria. Similarly, while we can date the East Wonsdyke firmly to some time after the Roman period, it has been seen both as an unfinished monument, built by the Britons and made redundant by the British victory at Mount Baden, and is also seen as a much later boundary between the Wessex and Mercian kingdoms. We cannot refine the chronology enough to be sure. In a sense, all the dikes are prehistoric, because they sit outside of the written record. There are no contemporary references to the dikes, um, there's a single dubious reference to Offa's dyke, and there's no information on how they functioned or intended to function. This really makes it difficult to put the linear earthworks into the narrative of the early medieval period, if we're not sure why they fit chronologically, or if they are really early medieval. And this is possibly one of the reasons why studies of the linear earthworks have been needed marginalised and it's slightly outside of the mainstream. Um, one of the things I hope this session can do is to raise the profile of the dikes. This marginalisation has not always been the case. The linear earthworks attracted a lot of attention from archaeologists in the 18th and 19th centuries, with what today seem long and rather tedious arguments as to their origin. Were they really Roman roads? Were they Celtic or were they Saxon monuments? But you might say the golden age of the study of linear earthworks was a period from the 1920s to about 1940. This is a rather dapper photo of Sir Cyril Fox. Um, he did his work on the Cambridgeshire dikes in the early 1920s and the field work for his great study of Offa's dike in the late 20s and early 30s. Meanwhile, OGS Crawford at the Ordnance Survey was especially interested in the Dark Age dikes for his mapping of the Dark Ages. <coughs> Even Mortimer Wheeler was interested. In a paper of 1934, Wheeler suggested that the series of linear earthworks known as the Grimm's Ditches along the Chilterns marked out the boundary of the territory of a political unit based on post-Roman London. There was no field work, this was entirely speculation, and there was no dating for these ditches. Wheeler sort of threw out this idea, but never went back to it, and never published anything else again on early medieval earthworks. Later on, Cyril Fox with Aileen Fox did field work on the East and West Bonds Dikes in the 1950s. This work is a bit more problematic in some of its interpretations and its assumptions, and I will come back to this bit later. It is noteworthy that these archaeologists all had interests mainly in the prehistoric and Roman periods, and not specifically the early medieval period. 
also they had no direct successors following them after they'd all done the dikes. No one to carry on with the field work. And this is probably another reason for what might be called a benign neglect to set in. What Crawford and Fox did do was to leave a grand narrative or model about the linear earthworks which went unchallenged up to about the 1960s. The accumulation of all this work in the 20s and 30s was the Ordnance Survey map of Britain in the Dark Ages. OGS Crawford said it was the best thing he'd ever done. And, and that's the quote there. Um, and the cover drawing for the south sheet is from the Utrecht Psalter, showing Saxon soldiers gazing in awe at the battlements of a Roman fort, which is um, very suggestive. I don't have time to go into the icon iconography of all, but... Um, But when it came to the earthworks, Crawford had to decide which of the earthworks he had to include on his map, and he decided to be generous. Wheeler's suggested children's Grimm's ditch became fixed on the map as a certain early medieval monument. It became an official map stamped with the authority of the Ordnance Survey and defined what was an early medieval dike and what wasn't. What was excluded from the map is as interesting as what was included. There is only a small portion of one Roman road shown on the map because there is an assumption that they have all gone out of use completely by the early medieval period. But all of the prehistoric ridgeways are marked. Crawford also states that the Grimm's Ditch in Witchwood, Oxfordshire is excluded as it surrounds a group of Roman villas. Uh, we now know it's Iron Age in date. And also excluded was the Grimsditch close to Silchester, because Crawford regarded these as too early, um, presumably be meaning they were sometime before 410. Another incredibly useful source for the um, background of the dikes was Cyril Fox's The Personality of Britain. And this is the fourth edition, published in Cardiff in 1943 to uh, war economy standards. It's here we see the assumptions about the environmental and historical background of Britain being made very explicit and shows how the dikes fit into the framework. Uh, this framework can be boiled down to four big assumptions. One, all cultural change was caused by invasion or migration, and southern Britain was right in the front line of this invasion. Southern Britain was mainly covered by damp oak wood, and only the lighter soils were able to be cultivated before the Anglo-Saxon period. Ridgeways were the only ways to move around this landscape between the lighter soils. And finally, Roman towns were occupied well into the 5th century and surviving civil or military administration was based on the towns, or at least some kind of town life existed. I'll talk about each of the points in more detail now. In the 1930s and 40s, invasion from Europe wasn't a hypothesis or a theory, but a real threat. This is the detail from the cover of the Personality of Britain, showing the routes into Britain of traders and invaders. And remember this is published in 1943, you know, it could be the routes of the German army. Yeah. Uh, the idea of using linear earthworks as defences against such invaders was not such a, an out-of-the-way idea. Of course, when migration and, in, and invasion as an explanation of cultural change fell out of use, well, the dikes as defences didn't fit in anymore. 
if cultural change was a process of slow and peaceful assimilation caused by a handful of Anglo-Saxon settlers bringing in new trends in brooches and burials, why do we need such big defensive earthworks? The environmental background was crucial to the interpretation of the dikes. It was central to Fox's model of Britain that southern Britain was covered with what he called the damp oak wood. This goes all the way back to his book The Archaeology of the Cambridge Region in the 1920s. Uh, and here's his map of southern Britain and we just, ah, that's the detail. Now the dots are his map of the damp oak wood or marsh and you can see there's barely any room for archaeology there and that people were squeezed into the chalk and there's a great assumption that this oak wood um, was not passable you just couldn't walk through it and I can't stress enough how important this concept was the phrase damp oak wood occurs again and again in Fox's writings. And the impassability of the damp oak wood was useful when considering the function of the dikes. Any gaps in a dike that could not be found by excavation or field work could be plugged by impenetrable jungle. This was Cyril Fox's exact phrase for the gap in Offa's dike in North Herefordshire. Any dikes that ended abruptly must either abut this jungle or end on marshland. Even by the 1940s this model was becoming untenable as more and more sites were being found in southern England away from the chalk and lighter soils. Um, it was impossible to carry on with this. I mean there was a brief attempt to ascribe all settlement uh, on the claylands to an invasion of around 50 BC by the, the Belgae, um, but was rapidly abandoned. In the 1948 reissue of Archaeology of the Cambridge Shear Region, um, it has an appendix where Fox notes criticism of his soil model but just then rejected them without any argument at all. Fox's ne ideas never really changed from his 1923 book. Fox's attitude remained that all human communities, of course, threw off groups and families below the poverty line of their particular culture, who scratch a miserable living how they can on these less desirable areas. Evidence of such will certainly be found from time to time in the clays of the lowland, but they are negligible. In essence, he ignored the problem. We still, still see in Cyril and Aileen's Fox's work on the Wandsdyke in the 1950s, they still blocked all the missing sections of the West Wandsdyke with impenetrable jungle to explain away the gaps. Right, we now come to the ridgeways. Uh, the idea of ridgeways has yeah. proved to be an enduring archaeological myth. This is OGS Crawford's map of the four great routes of prehistoric Britain. Uh, Crawford thought that um, the ridgeways survived from prehistoric period all the way through, but Roman roads didn't. There are a whole network of smaller ridgeways and tracks as well. Um, and it became something of a sport for local archaeological societies to map these. And obviously, if the only way you could move around this landscape, if there are no Roman roads left, and it was impenetrable, you could control movement along the, around the countryside, around the landscape, by building a dike. Okay. Um, 
Unfortunately, the idea of ridgeways and linear earthworks became codependent. Crawford proved the existence of the Ignald Way into Cambridgeshire by the existence of the great dikes which blocked their path. The purpose of the dikes was to bar ridgeways, so if one existed, then the other had to. The idea of the ridgeways clings on today in a much reduced form, but they're seen as vague zones of communication, up to a mile or more wide, and not formal routes. If the dikes don't block ridgeways anymore, what's their purpose? All right, I'm going to skip over the next section rather briefly. Um, this is the suggested map of Roman earthworks or post Roman earthworks around Silchester. And dating of the dikes was based on one single excavation on land that um, became RF Green and Common. I don't have time to go into details of what was a salvage excavation done in incredibly difficult conditions in wartime, but some very clearly Iron Age earthworks were marked as post-Roman. And remember when people now argue for post-Roman occupation of Silchester using the earthworks as evidence, um, it was because the earthworks were dated um, by the post-Roman occupation, not the other way around. Right, um, there's no real collapse of this model, just a slow deflation. Uh, um, archaeologists moved on in their understanding of the environment of Britain and the archaeology of the early medieval period. The landscape of southern Britain was much more open and populated than Fox believed. Ridgeways didn't exist as fixed narrow routes. And post-Roman cities had negligible population. And of course many of the suggested Dark Age dikes are in fact Iron Age. The dikes no longer fitted. They fell outside of the mainstream of the early medieval period. All right, and just to uh, conclude, in a sense, the major work on the dikes in the mid 20th century was too successful. It was regarded as done and finished. The field work was well done, but difficult to challenge the conclusions of such eminent archaeologists. They were interpreted in a historical and environmental framework that no longer holds true. And of course, no grand revolution in the grand narrative, just a slow whittling away of the ideas behind it. And no replacement with a new model. The dikes now fit awkwardly into early medieval archaeology. They are still, in a sense, prehistoric monuments. <coughs> and I will conclude there. Thank you. <laughs>